Hello, I'm Lauren Taylor. We start here in London, where the UK Prime Minister will argue in a major speech in the next hour that Britain stands at a crossroads ahead of what he will call some dangerous years in which almost every aspect of life will change. We're expecting Rishi Sunak to argue that his bold ideas can create a more secure future for Britons ahead of an election expected later this year. Well, this comes days after the Conservatives' bleak showing in local elections. Uh, let's uh, talk to Hannah Miller, who's in central London, uh, about to listen to that speech. So, Hannah, it's been a difficult time in the last couple of weeks for, for the government because of those election results. So, presumably, he's hoping that to change the subject now. Yeah, another attempt to reset the dial and capture people's imaginations as to what the Conservatives could deliver if they got another term in office. Rishi Sunak is not even hiding the fact that this speech is about a general election. While he'll stand there as Prime Minister, he has the power to make changes and do the things that he says he wants to do. But he is talking about the five years beyond whenever that general election will be held. We're not aware of any new policy that we're expecting to hear from him when he makes this speech in the next few minutes. But it's more about the framing of the state of the country domestically and internationally. He wants to be seen as the person who can offer security. Downing Street have released some parts of the speech in advance to try to get people talking about it and capture their headlines. He will say that almost every aspect of our lives is going to change over the next few years and point to dangers at home and abroad an increase in global immigration and also talk about what he sees as a threat to the country's shared values. We're also expecting him to try to paint something of a dividing line between the Conservatives and the Labour Party when it comes to defence spending. Rishi Sunak has pledged a few weeks ago now to increase defence spending to 2.5% of national income by 2030. Labour have also said that that will be their aspiration to meet that target, but they crucially haven't set a date as to when that is likely to be, and I think we can expect to hear Rishi Sunak making something about that, trying to paint himself as the person who is making national security a priority. Labour say the Tories can't fix the UK's problems because, and I quote, they are the problem, but we're expecting to hear this as kind of one of the arguments that Rishi Sunak will try to take to people in the next general election whenever it comes. And aside from the uh, international picture, there has been, domestically, it's been tricky for the Prime Minister recently because of a couple of defections. Yes, so uh, one of his MPs, Natalie Elphick, defected to the Labour Party, the Conservatives now kind of trying Hannah, to... sorry oh. to interrupt. Well, let's uh, just go straight to the... Listen to the Prime Minister. Warm welcome and your superb leadership of Policy Exchange. Uh, as you said, as a proud alumnus, I'm truly delighted to be back. Now, at some point in the second half of this year, we will all go to the polls and make a choice, not just about Conservatives versus Labour or Sunak versus Starmer. It will be a choice between the future and the past. Now, I remain confident that my party can prevail, not because of our record alone, but because we will be the only party really talking about the future, and not with vague, lofty platitudes, but with bold ideas and a clear plan that can change our society for the better and restore people's confidence and pride in our country. Now, I feel a profound sense of urgency because more will change in the next five years than in the last 30. I'm convinced that the next few years will be some of the most dangerous, yet the most transformational that our country has ever known. So the question we face today is this. Who has the clear plan and bold ideas to deliver a secure future for you and your family. The dangers that threaten our country are real. They're increasing in number. An axis of authoritarian states like Russia, Iran, North Korea and China is working together to undermine us and our values. War has returned to Europe, with our NATO allies warning that if Putin succeeds in Ukraine, they might be next. War rages too in the Middle East, as Israel defends itself not only against the terrorists of Hamas, but a barrage of missiles fired for the first time directly from Iran. Right now in Africa, conflicts are being fought in 18 different countries. And Putin's recklessness has taken us closer to a dangerous nuclear escalation than at any point since the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
Now, these are not faraway problems. Iranian proxies are firing on British ships in the Red Sea, disrupting goods destined for our high street. Here at home, China has conducted cyber-targeting of our democratically elected MPs. Russia has poisoned people with chemical weapons. And when Putin cut off the gas supplies, it had a devastating impact on people's lives and threatened our energy security. And in this world of greater conflict and danger, 100 million people are now displaced globally. Countries like Russia are weaponizing immigration for their own ends. And criminal gangs keep finding new routes to across European borders. Illegal migration is placing an intolerable strain on our security and our sense of fairness. And unless we act now and act boldly, this problem is only going to grow. Extremists are also exploiting these global conflicts to divide us. People are abusing our liberal democratic values, the freedom of speech, right to protest, to intimidate, threaten and assault others, to sing anti-Semitic chants on our streets and our university campuses, and to weaponize the evils of anti-Semitism or anti-Muslim hatred in a divisive, ideological attempt to set Britain against Britain. And from gender activists hijacking children's sex education to cancel culture, vocal and aggressive fringe groups are trying to impose their views on the rest of us. They're trying to make it morally unacceptable to believe something different and undermine people's confidence and pride in our own history and identity. Scottish nationalists are even trying to tear our United Kingdom apart. But for all the dangers ahead, few are felt more acutely than people's sense of financial insecurity. We've been pounded by a series of once-in-a-generation shocks, the worst international financial crisis since the Great Depression in the 1930s, the first global pandemic since the Spanish flu in 1918, the biggest energy shock since the 1970s, global forces, yet they are hitting our living standards here at home. We must be prepared strategically, economically, with robust plans and greater national resilience to meet this time of instability with strength. And people's sense of insecurity is only heightened by the fears about new technologies like AI. When the IMF says 40% of jobs could be affected, or hundreds of leading experts say the risk could be on a par with pandemics or nuclear war, and when children are exposed to bullying, sexualized content, or even self-harm online, People want to know that they've got someone in charge who understands these dangers. Because only if you understand what is happening can you be trusted to keep us safe. But the paradox of our age is that for all the profound dangers that we face right now, we also hold in our hands an opportunity for human progress that could surpass the Industrial Revolution in speed and breadth. Technologies like AI will do for the 21st century what the steam engine and electricity did for the 19th. They'll accelerate human progress by complementing what we do, speeding up the discovery of new ideas, and by assisting almost every aspect of human life. Think of the investment they will bring, the jobs they'll create, and the increase in all our living standards that they'll deliver. Credible estimates suggest AI alone could double our productivity in the next decade and in doing so, help us create a world of less suffering, more freedom, choice, and opportunity. Just imagine every child in school with their own personalized tutor, and every teacher free to spend more time personally developing each student. New frontiers in medical diagnostics, where a single picture of your eyes can not only detect blindness, but predict other diseases like heart attacks or Parkinson's. And counterintuitive as it may seem, Throughout human history, the greatest breakthroughs of science and learning have so often come at the moments of greatest danger. The first electronic digital computers were developed by British codebreakers in the Second World War. Solar technology went from powering pocket calculators to a viable commercial technology following the energy crisis of the 1970s. The fastest development and deployment of a vaccine in history came during the COVID pandemic. So it is incumbent upon us to make this a period not just of great danger, but great progress too. That's why we launched a bold plan to make science and technology our new national purpose. 
We're rightly proud of Britain's spirit of discovery and entrepreneurship that made us the leading country in the Industrial Revolution. But we can be just as proud, just as confident, just as optimistic about our future and our prospects to lead again in this new industrial age. And doing so will enrich our lives and create good, well-paid jobs in the growth industries of the future here at home. At the same time, new and fast-growing economic superpowers like India, Indonesia and Nigeria are significantly reshaping the global economy. And just as this ever more interconnected world creates new dangers, it also creates new possibilities. The United Kingdom is uniquely placed to benefit. We've always been an open, trading, maritime nation, and Brexit has given the opportunity for us to trade even more. And we invent, discover, and produce new products and services that the world wants to buy. From aircraft wings in Filton, to financial services in Glasgow, to incredible cultural exports like film, music, and TV, or sports like the Premier League. Everywhere from rural Kenya to the cityscapes of South Korea, people stay up at all times of the day and night to watch their favourite British team. It's no wonder that Brexit Britain has leapt above France, Japan and the Netherlands to become the world's fourth biggest exporter. And the more we export, the better our businesses will do, the more jobs we'll create, the more wealth we'll generate right across our country. So this is the opportunity before us, a world transformed by technological progress. Huge global markets hungry for new talent, goods and services. And you can see it all around us. Two brothers from Merseyside sat around their kitchen table and built Castor, a billion pound sportswear business, taking on global giants like Nike and Adidas. Their kit now worn by Red Bull Formula One and Bayer Leverkusen. British companies and workers right across the country are pioneering, pioneering offshore wind and exporting it around the world. Now already we've built the world's first floating offshore wind farm and our innovations have helped reduce the cost of wind energy by around two thirds and increase the size of the turbines to the equivalent of the Eiffel Tower with blades bigger than Big Ben. And you can see the opportunity too in healthcare, giving people longer, healthier lives. In Denmark, Novo Nordisk created the Azempic drug which is not only helping to tackle chronic disease globally, but single-handedly grew Denmark's entire economy last year. So all this progress should show us that while this is one of the most dangerous periods we've ever known, it will also be one of the most transformational. And if we make the right choices, if we have a bold enough vision, then we should feel confidence, pride, and optimism that Britain's future is secure. So my point is this, our country stands at a crossroads. <clears throat> Over the next few years, from our democracy, to our society, to our economy, to the hardest questions of war and peace, almost every aspect of our lives is going to change. And how we act in the face of those changes, not only to keep people safe and secure, but to realise the opportunities too, will determine whether or not Britain will succeed in the years to come. And there is an important choice facing the country. Because despite having 14 years with nothing to do but think about the future, Labour have almost nothing to say about it. No plans for our border, no plans for our energy security, no plans for our economy either, and no principles either. Keir Starmer's gone from embracing Jeremy Corbyn to Natalie Elphick, all in the cynical pursuit of power at any price. So Labour have no ideas. What they did have, they've U-turned on. They have just one thing, a calculation that they can make you feel so bad about your country that you won't have the energy to ask what they might do with the incredible power that they seek to yield. Now, I'm not saying that the past doesn't matter. I know people are feeling anxious and uncertain that their sense of confidence and pride in this country has been knocked. I understand that. I accept it, and I want to change it. But what I cannot accept is Labour's idea that all the worries you have are because of 14 years of Conservative government, that all you need to do is change the people in office and these problems will magically disappear. It's just not true. In the last 14 years, 
We've made progress in the most difficult conditions any governments have faced since the Second World War. A world-leading economy. We've seen the third highest growth rate in the G7 and created 4 million jobs, 800 a day. We took difficult decisions to recall, re restore our country's financial security and control national debt. And that allowed us to support the country through COVID, deliver the fastest vaccine rollout in the world, provide record funding to the NHS, and protect pensions with the triple lock. We've reformed welfare by capping benefits and introducing universal credit to help people into work. We've reduced absolute poverty, pensioner poverty, child poverty. We've cut carbon emissions by a third, maintained our position as NATO's second biggest defence power, halved violent and neighbourhood crime, and improved standards in our schools with English school children, not just the best readers in the UK, but in the Western world. We've legislated for equal marriage, and it is now not even surprising for people from ethnically diverse backgrounds to lead Scotland, Wales, and the United Kingdom. And the economy now decisively has momentum. Inflation down from over 11% to 3%. Wages rising faster than prices. And in the first quarter of this year, we grew faster than France, Germany, Japan, Italy, and even America. The plan is working, so we must stick to it and not go back to square one. And when Labour ignores the achievements of the last 14 years, or try to reduce the last 14 years to 49 days, remember what they're actually doing is trying to distract you from the thing that matters most, the future. Now I'm clear-eyed enough to admit that yes, maybe they can depress their way to victory with all their talk of doom loops and gaslighting and scaremongering about pensions. But I don't think it will work. Because at heart, we're a nation of optimists. We're not blind to the challenges or threats that we face. We just have an innate belief that whatever they are, we can overcome them, as we have done so many times in our history, and create a secure future for you and your family. So let me tell you more about my vision for how I would lead this country through this time of danger and transformation. The highest priority of a Conservative government is to keep our country safe. We've proudly taken the generational decision to increase defence spending to a new baseline of 2.5% of GDP by 2030. Yet Labour have refused to match our pledge. Keir Starmer supported a former Labour leader who wanted to abolish the army and withdraw from NATO. And Labour's current deputy leader, shadow foreign secretary and many others voted against our nuclear deterrent, the ultimate guarantor of our security. Now Labour want to pretend that this is all history, ancient history, but it's not, and it should worry us. Because the defence of our country and our values requires seriousness of purpose, moral clarity, and the willingness to make big choices and sacrifices elsewhere to fund it. Either you believe the world is more dangerous, or you don't. Either you have the strength to lead, or you don't. And yes, the global displacement of 100 million people is a new and defining challenge of our age. But we can and will protect ourselves against illegal migration. Because only we Conservatives have the strength to challenge conventions and do something different about it. Tinkering just won't work. That's why we're pioneering the Rwanda scheme. And so when people see that if they come here illegally, they will be swiftly detained and removed, they will be deterred from making that perilous journey, stopping the boats and saving thousands of lives. Now, I know that our international frameworks are outdated, so there may be flashpoints ahead with the ECHR. And if the Strasbourg court make me choose between the ECHR and this country's security, I will choose our country's security every single time. Yeah. And nor will I ever compromise on defending our values, our history, our way of life against those who seek to undermine them. I am unapologetically proud of who we are. And under my leadership, Ours will be a country where people can disagree in good faith, but where they must do with respect and decency for others. 
a country where the b benefits of belonging to our union are self-evident to the overwhelming majority of our people, a country where we strengthen and protect the greatest institution of all, the family, better protect children from the harms of the online and offline worlds, and do more to protect single-sex spaces, a country where we celebrate the small acts of kindness that bind our society together and where we actively work to rebuild the civic involvement and pride that have always formed part of our distinctive national culture. A country where we honour those prepared to pay the highest price for our freedoms as we make the best place in the world to be a veteran here at home. And a country where we properly respect the older generation. They've contributed all their lives. So whatever the triple lock costs, it's morally right to give older people dignity and comfort in retirement. But as well as strengthening our national security and restoring pride in our national culture, we'll also protect you from the dangers of a more unstable world by giving you greater peace of mind over your financial security. The people have been struggling to make ends meet. I know that. In the last few years, you've seen rising energy bills, mortgage rates, the cost of the weekly shop. And I hope I've shown that through my time in office, that from furlough to support with your energy bills, the government I lead will always be there for you. But that's only possible if we take the tough decisions to strengthen the country's finances and control debt. And you can trust me to do that. When I stood for the leadership of my party and my opponent's policies imperiled our financial strength, I was sooner prepared to lose than abandon what I believe so deeply is right for our country. I feel the same conviction about net zero. In a more unstable world where dictators like Putin have held us to ransom over energy prices, I reject the ideological zeal of those who want us to adopt policies that go further, faster than any other country, no matter what the cost or disruption to people's lives. That's exactly Labour's approach. They act like a pressure group, not a would-be government. And the Conservatives will govern in the national interest, leading us to net zero in a serious, hard-headed way that prioritises our nation's energy security and the financial security of hard-working families. Now, but even as we strengthen our security and our sense of pride and confidence in ourselves, I also feel a sense of urgency about readying our country to succeed in a world transformed. And that starts by giving all our young people, wherever they live, whatever their background, the skills and the knowledge to succeed. Building on the success of the last 14 years, we will create a truly world-class education system. The Advanced British Standard is the most far-reaching reform to education for 16 to 18-year-olds in a generation. We're tearing down the artificial barriers between technical and academic education, increasing children's time in the classroom, studying a greater breadth of subjects to match our competitors, and unapologetically saying that every single child must leave school not just literate, but numerate as well. Now, I know that this will not win universal acclaim, but maths will be fundamental to our children's life chances in this new technological age. And it is our duty to give them those skills. And more, we'll end rip-off degrees and massively expand the number of apprenticeships because a degree is not the only path to success in the modern economy. And we'll make sure that everyone has the funding they need to retrain or learn new skills at any point in their lives, because in the future, education won't stop when you walk out of the school gates. But for Britain to finish first in today's world, we don't just need the skills to succeed, we need to create a dynamic, innovative economy fueled by technological progress so we lead in the industries of the future and help you and your family become wealthier and more economically secure. And the government I lead is creating the conditions for a new British dynamism by investing in the new infrastructure of the future, not just roads, railways and buses, but gigabit broadband, research and development, computing power, by helping to create hundreds of thousands of good, secure, well-paid, highly skilled jobs that will level up opportunity right across the country. And yes, by taking the necessary decisions to build the right homes in the right places to support those jobs. But true British dynamism won't come from the state alone. It will come from you.
It will come from the ingenuity and creativity of the British people, given the support, the opportunities and the rewards to have, pursue and realise big ambitions. If you have a brilliant idea, I want you to build it. If you're passionate about solving a problem, I want you to pursue it. And if you simply want to set up on your own, I want you to get out there and do it. Because you won't find the future written in a slide deck in a Whitehall quango. You'll find it out there in our country. And so the government I lead will create the conditions for people themselves to try, to build, to invent. Yes, sometimes to fail, but more often to succeed. That's why we're cutting taxes directly on investment. It's why we're cutting taxes to encourage innovation. And it's why we're seizing the freedom and the flexibility of Brexit. Because so often the EU's default approach was top-down precautionary regulation, whereas we in the UK now have the chance to be more agile, so that rather than stifling innovation and growth, we encourage it in everything from financial services to agriculture, from healthcare to house building. And above all, we will reward hard work. Because you don't get anywhere in life without hard work. So we're making the tax system simpler, fairer and more rewarding, cutting national insurance by £900 for the average worker, alongside increasing the state pension by £900 this year. We're raising the national living wage to end low pay, and we're reforming welfare to make sure that work always pays, and our safety net is fair to those who pay for it. Not least because people, giving people support to get off welfare and into work gives them purpose, dignity and hope, and it is also the only sustainable way to cut legal migration. So a world-class education system, a dynamic, innovative economy, hard work valued and rewarded, that's how Britain will succeed in the future. That's how we'll grow the economy. And that's how we'll transform public services too. Imagine a welfare system where new technologies allow us to crack down on the fraudsters, exploiting the hard-working taxpayers who fund it. Imagine the huge opportunities to cut crime, through technologies like live facial recognition, helping police catch wanted criminals, find missing people, spend more time on the beat. And imagine our NHS, still free at the point of use, but transformed for the future. A service staffed by tens of thousands more doctors and nurses, thanks to our long-term workforce plan. Backed by record funding made possible by years of fiscal discipline, with far greater choice over where you can receive your care made as simple as choosing what to watch on iPlayer. And I believe there will be no more powerful example of what all the forces of British dynamism, innovation, scientific discovery, and technological progress can achieve than this. To address, finally, the fear of one word that still lurks in the back of everyone's minds, that touches almost every family in the country, and that envelops our whole world if we or a loved one hear it. Cancer. Yet even here, if we are bold enough, there can be cause for new hope. We already know that we can prevent most lung cancers, the UK's leading cause of cancer deaths, by stopping smoking. That's why I took the important decision to create a smoke-free generation. And with huge breakthroughs in early diagnosis and new treatments like the mRNA vaccine for skin cancer, I believe we can be just as bold and ambitious in improving rates of cancer survival. Because if we can bring together my vision of a country transformed with our world-class education system that trains PhD oncologists and apprentice lab technicians, and our dynamic economy that attracts investors and incubates the billion pound biotech businesses of the future, our post-Brexit regulatory freedoms to approve trials in a safe but faster way, and the scale of our NHS to help us research and trial those new drugs in a way that no other country can, then just one example of the incredible achievements this country can make would be to make a generational breakthrough against this cruel disease and fundamentally change what it will mean for our children and grandchildren to hear the word cancer. So today, I've set out my vision for how Britain can succeed in one of the most dangerous yet transformational eras we've ever known. The values that lie behind that vision are a new patriotism, a confidence in ourselves and in all that we can achieve. I refuse to accept the doomsterism and the cynical narrative of decline that my opponents hope will depress people into voting for them. 
and I reject those who insidiously question our history and our identity. I believe in that innate confidence in ourselves that has always run through our island story. And just as we're proud of all that we created, invented, and discovered in our past, so we can be confident and optimistic about what we will achieve in our future. My pledge to you is that I will create the conditions to make that possible, to help you fulfill your ambitions, to build the world-class education system that gives our children the skills they need to succeed no matter where they started in life, to create that dynamic, innovative economy that will give you the opportunity of a wealthier, more financially secure life for you and your family, to restore our sense of civic pride and national cohesion so that we can be secure in the knowledge that we are all on the same side. And above all, you can trust me to keep you and your family safe and secure from the threats we face at home and abroad. There are storms ahead. The dangers are all too real. But Britain can feel proud again. Britain can feel confident again. Because with bold action and a clear plan, we can and we will create a secure future. Thank you. Thank you very much. We just turned to some questions from the media. If I could start with the Sun, please. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you, Prime Minister. Harry Cole from the Sun. Um, you mentioned our secure future and defence spending and uh, security being on the ballot paper. Um, but when the Tories took power in 2010, defence spending was running at 2.47% of GDP. In 2015, after the annexation of Crimea, that fell to 2.03%. Despite your uplift as Chancellor, it's still lower today as a percentage than when your party took office 14 years ago. And it won't hit 2.5% until a long time after the next election. So you talk of all these profound dangers, but aren't you coming to this far too late? And how can voters really believe that your security is safe in the Tories when they look at the four last 14 years of spending? So, Harry, I could just completely reject the premise of what you said. When the last Conservative government came into office in 2010, the country was bankrupted. Everyone remembers the note that was left, that was no money left. And that government, my predecessors, had to make some pretty tough choices. But they decided, rightly, to prioritise defence spending. And it maintained 2% of GDP since 2010 for a decade, which was the NATO standard that actually the UK pioneered at the summit in Wales in 2014. And if you look at that last 10 years, we have remained one of the few countries in NATO to meet that 2% standard. We've remained the largest defence power in Europe and the second largest in NATO behind the US. So actually I applaud and I'm grateful to my predecessors, including David Cameron, for making that difficult decision. I'm not sure it's a decision that the Labour Party would have made because they're not making that decision today. And that's the question going forward, is the choice in the future. You've got a party that you've always been able to trust with defence and you can trust them and trust me when we think about the future because sadly we are living in the most dangerous time that we've seen since the Cold War. And I believe that the next few years will be one of the most dangerous times our country has ever lived through. An axis of authoritarian states, Iran, Russia, North Korea, China, acting in an assertive way that is threatening our values, threatening our interests abroad and at home in a more interconnected world. And what are we doing to meet that threat? We've made the generational decision to strengthen our national defense and increase defense spending to a new standard. And that's not just all on the come. When I made that announcement a few weeks ago, it was coupled with an instant increase in our defence spending of half a billion pounds to support Ukraine, which, as everyone can see from the news today, is absolutely the right imperative, because an investment in Ukraine's security is an investment in our security. We have peace through strength. We have to restore deterrence, and that's why it's imperative that Putin fails. And the question at the election is that choice. Who can you trust to keep you safe in this more dangerous world? Well, you can trust me, you can trust the Conservatives, because we've made that decision. That requires leadership, it requires us to prioritise defence. That's not easy. There were plenty of people who said, well, you should do other things instead. I don't think that's the right thing for our country. But Keir Starmer's made it very clear 
that he doesn't agree with that. He doesn't agree that this is a more dangerous time that requires us to invest more in defence. Hasn't matched that pledge. This is someone who supported Jeremy Corbyn, who wanted to scrap the army and leave NATO that you talk about. And as I said, right now, the deputy leader of the Labour Party, the shadow foreign secretary and multiple other members voted against our nuclear deterrent. That is the ultimate guarantee of our security. So I actually think that choice is very clear, that it is a more dangerous world. Anyone who's pretending to you that it isn't, isn't being straight with the public. And the right thing to do for our country in that environment is to increase more in defence. That's the decision we've made, and I'm confident that the country will agree with it. Uh, next, can I go to the Daily Telegraph? Thank you, Prime Minister. Ben Riley smith from the Daily Telegraph. You're laying out your election pitch, but you won't tell us when the election is. Can you just be categorical and say you're not going to call an election for July? So, Ben, I've been clear, I think, since right at the beginning of this year that my working assumption is that we'll have an election in the second half of this year. Now, look, obviously, this question about election timing is a game that the Labour Party want to play, right? They want to make everything about process and not about substance. But I think the country deserves a more substantive debate than that. And look, when that election campaign does come, when people are considering that choice, I am happy to debate Keir Starmer as many times as he would like on that choice. I'm being very clear. I think this is the most dangerous and transformational time that our country has experienced in generations. That's the choice at the election. That's the substance that we should be debating. Now, I'm clear we are prepared to take the bold action that is necessary, that we have a clear plan that is working to deliver a secure future for everyone in our country. That's what the election should be about. That's the debate that we should be having, not on process and timing. I'm looking forward to those debates when they come. Uh, next, ITV. <coughs> oh, best of, uh, ITV. Um, Prime Minister, you talk about the importance of growth and security, but since the 2019 election, we've had economic chaos, we've had what you might call ethical chaos, we've had more turnover of ministers and prime ministers than during any government in history. We've got trauma in the health service. Why on earth shouldn't voters look at the recent past as a guide to the future under a Tory government? Um, and just separately, a number of your Tory colleagues have said to me, that it's good riddance to Natalie Elphick. Do you agree with them? Um, Robert, thanks. Look, on this, question about, uh, on this question about the past and the future, let me, let me be crystal clear. No, I'm not standing here pretending that everything's been perfect about the last 14 years. Of course I'm not. Right? But I am incredibly proud of our record in government. In some of the most difficult circumstances that any governments have faced since the end of the Second World War, not least starting with a country that was left in a financially bankrupt state. And I went through the list of achievements, I won't go over them all over again, but whether you look at the economy, whether you look at the transformation in our schools, whether you look at the strengthening of our defence, the welfare system, our progress on climate change, all these things, how we've progressed as a society in inclusiveness, it's a record to be proud of. Of course, there will be areas which are far from perfect, and I accept that. Um, but you talk more recently about the last few years. Those are global shocks. The pandemic didn't just happen to the UK. The war in Ukraine had an impact on energy bills, not just in the UK. What's happening right now in the Middle East is not just something that concerns the United Kingdom. Right? The world is becoming a more dangerous place. And the question that I hope the country asks themselves at the election is about the future, because that's what's at stake at a time that is more dangerous, is potentially more transformational than at any point that we've known in a long time, who can you trust to have the bold ideas, to have the clear plan that will deliver a secure future for you? And you talk about track record, people can judge me on my track record since I've had this job, right? Tackling a more pragmatic, hard-headed approach to net zero, ensuring that we have secured our economic recovery, as you and I were discussing last week, delivering tax cuts, making sure we're investing in the industries of the future, taking advantage of Brexit, growing our trade. These are all the things that we've done just in the last 18 months. And that brings me on to Natalie Elphick. And look, actually, more than anything, I think it shows less about her, and it's more about Keir Starmer. And it shows him to be completely and utterly unprincipled. Right? This is someone who went from embracing Jeremy Corbyn to embracing Natalie Elphick. It just tells you that you can't trust what the guy says. Right? And if you're trying to be everything to everyone, fundamentally, you don't stand for anything. 
And I think that will be increasingly clear to people. And on the substantive topic about illegal migration, which Labour have been trying to talk about, I mean, they announced that you were all there. They announced a, a plan last week, which, when I went through it, essentially is exactly the same plan that I announced that you all listened to a year ago that we've already implemented, that's already making a difference, but they left out the most important part, which is that you've got to have a deterrent. That's the boldness that's required if you're going to deal with the insecurity that we face. Right? No amount of extra caseworkers are going to change that. Right? You've got to make it crystal clear that if you come to our country illegally, you won't be able to stay. That's what the National Crime Agency think. That's how we've solved illegal migration from Albania. Right? That's what you need. That's why the Rwanda scheme is so important. And he's been very clear right, that he ultimately is going to grant an amnesty for illegal migrants, which just allow thousands of them to enter here and to stay here. And as Natalie Elphick herself said in the not-too-distant past, Labour are an open borders, pro-immigration party that doesn't want to stop the boats. Her words, not mine. Uh, next, can I go to the BBC. <coughs> Thank you, Chris Mason, BBC News. Uh, <coughs> let's cut to the quick here, Prime Minister. Are you saying the country would be less safe under Keir Starmer? And in summary, is this the beginning of an argument from you that says, be careful what you wish for, better the devil you know? In a word, yes, Chris. <laughs> um, uh, I, I'm, I'm very clear, right? Matt, I'm the Prime Minister of this country, I've been doing this job, and I've set out today that I believe that the next few years will be both the most dangerous that our country has experienced in a long time and also the most transformational. Now, you can disagree or agree with that, but I happen to think that's the truth. Everything that we're seeing in the world from today, from the last week, last few months, tells me that there's an incredibly dangerous time. And what the country needs, what the country wants, what the country deserves is to know that there's a secure future for them and their families ahead. That is the choice at the next election, and I'm also clear that my track record and the decisions that we're making in government show that we are the party that has the bold action, the clear plan to deliver that secure future. That's a debate that I'm looking forward to having. Uh, next, uh, Daily Mail. <coughs> Thanks, PM. Um, uh, you said you want to fight the uh, election campaign on the future, not the past. Does that mean that there'll be no place for Boris Johnson when it comes to the campaign? Yeah. Now, I've been clear about this as well in the past, right? I, I want every Conservative who shares the vision that I do to be part of that campaign to, fa to fight for the things that we believe in. Now, ultimately, look, of course, the Conservative family is a broad church, but we're united by a set of values. And that set of values that I talked about earlier on are founded in innate optimism about our country and what it can ch achieve, an intrinsic sense of pride in our history and our identity and a knowledge that actually progress comes from people, not from the state. And that's about creating the dynamic, innovative economy I talked about, seizing the opportunities of Brexit, recapturing what we had. We led the world in the Industrial Revolution. Right? That's what we did in this country. That was the most extraordinary time of change and progress for humanity and for British people. We led that. And I see no reason why we can't lead again in the future. And that vision that I pointed out and outlined of a more secure future for families, where we can have confidence in our strength, where we're protecting people from the threats we face when we're securing our borders, we have a pragmatic approach to net zero that's serious, that's hard-headed, that makes sure that we give everyone in our country financial security, that is a conservative message that I'm confident everyone can get behind. And the choice of the next election is not between this conservative and that conservative. The choice of the next election is between me and Keir Starmer, it's between the Conservatives and Labour, but crucially, it's about the future versus the past, and we are the only party that is talking properly about the future and has a plan to deliver a secure future for our country. Uh, next, LBC. Hi, Natasha from LBC. Just to follow up on Chris's question, so are you saying today that you think that Keir Starmer would make this country more unsafe? Um, and on Ukraine, it was reported over the weekend that David Cameron persuaded Donald Trump to back more funding for Ukraine on the premise he could secure a peace deal. Can you uh, <coughs> assure us that the West is not about to force Ukraine into taking a peace deal? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I believe that we will keep this country safe, and Keir Starmer's actions demonstrate that he won't be able to do that. I, I believe this is the most dangerous time that we've faced for generations. That's why we've made the decision to increase defence spending to 2.5%. That's not an easy decision. Right, that is a decision that we've made, that's a choice that we've made, that's a priority that we think is right for the country. 
Keir Starmer and the Labour Party have been crystal clear that they don't believe in that. They will not match that choice. Right? So there's no way you can keep the country safe and secure from the growing threats we face. Iran, China, North Korea, Russia acting together unless you are prepared to invest in our defense. It's as simple as that. There's a very clear dividing line there, which I'm sure everyone can appreciate. And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when it comes to this question, right, his track record will tell you that. And I don't say this for political point scoring, but that is just the reality of the situation. You, he's someone who believed Jeremy Corbyn would make a good prime minister of our country, not once, but twice. Right? Jeremy Corbyn wanted to pull us out of NATO, wanted to scrap the army. Multiple members of the, the, the government that Labour would provide don't believe in a nuclear deterrent. So I don't see how you can, with a straight face, say to the country, yes, I'm prepared to do what it takes to keep you safe. The evidence just doesn't suggest that at all. And it's because of that increase in defence spending that I can stand here and provide more support to Ukraine. And not just that can say that that support to Ukraine will be provided for as long as is necessary to repel Russian aggression. Keir Starmer can't stand here and make that pledge. And actually, Labour Party and Keir Starmer not matching our investment on defence spending emboldens our adversaries. What do you think Putin thinks when he sees that? That he thinks the West isn't prepared to make the tough choices to invest in their security? Because Russia's economy has mobilised for war. He's continuing to be aggressive. We need to meet that aggression with strength and allied strength. And not to comment on individual conversations, but with actions, that's what we're doing. We've always led in NATO. The 2014 summit here in the UK, we set the 2% pledge, one of the few countries to meet it for a decade. And we're doing the same thing again now. A new baseline for NATO, 2.5% of GDP, that yes, other countries I hope over time will come to match because an investment in our collective security is a right thing for this time and Keir Starmer's inability to say that he will match it emboldens our adversaries and doesn't demonstrate leadership to our allies at exactly the time that that's what we need. Uh, next, could I go to Sky? Um, Prime Minister, thank you. Um, after the local elections, uh, you said the results suggested we're heading for a hung parliament with Labour as the largest party. You've also ruled out doing any deal with another party. So as you outline these future threats, why have you openly admitted that you're not going to be able to stay on as Prime Minister? Thank you. Sorry, Beth, I'm not entirely sure I understood the question. But well, what I would say is that it wasn't me who said those things. That was independent election analysts who made those points about the results of the local elections. You know, my point is we've had the local elections now. The next election that our country is going to face is the general election. And the choice of that general election is clear. As I said, it's about the future versus the past. And as I've set out today, we have a clear understanding of what the future entails. The most dangerous time that we've known in a long time, but also the most transformational. And it is only us, it is only me, that have the bold ideas and the clear plan that will deliver a secure future for the country. And that's the substance of the debate that I'll be having at the next election. And then lastly, if we could just go to Channel 4. Thank you very much, uh, Prime Minister. Can I just follow on the uh, LBC question about uh, what that Sunday Times article said? Uh, it had some pretty uh, direct quotes uh, from Donald Trump. The suggestion was that we were encouraging him to think that a standoff between Ukraine and Russia would be a useful <coughs> position for him to inherit uh, if he comes to the White House, because that way he could put a deal on the table. Are we now in favour of a deal. It sounds from those quotes as though we are. And very quickly, if I may, because you, you were talking about asking the country to trust not just you, but the Conservative Party. It's only a few months since you were saying they were part of the failed consensus of the last 30 years. You're now drawing our attention to the record that uh, people should be proud of over the last 14 years. Which is it? And do you even trust the Conservative Party? It's not that long since you thought a marauding mob of people with letters were coming after you, is it? So on, I haven't seen this Sunday Times article, so forgive me for that. But what I can tell you very clearly is that we have led when it comes to Ukraine. Right? My predecessor, Boris Johnson, did that. I've continued that, not just in quantum, but also being the first to provide new capabilities. 
whether that was tanks, the decision I made, main battle tanks, long-range weapons, first to provide multi-bilateral security assurances for the long-term first to train uh, Ukrainian soldiers. So we have had a track record of leadership under me and my predecessors on that question, which I'm A, proud of, and everyone should be proud of it, but B, that's the right thing to do. Because if you want to strengthen this country's security, we need to re-establish deterrence. Right? An investment in Ukraine security is an investment in our security. Our NATO allies in Eastern Europe are already worried about the prospect, or the, if Putin is able to succeed, that they'll be next with all the consequences that would bring. And it's not just Putin that would be emboldened. It's our adversaries all around the world that are looking at this moment and seeing how we react to it. So in order to have security, we do need to invest more in defense. We do need to support Ukraine. That's what we've consistently done. Uh, but also it's right that we talk with our allies about that. And when it comes to the Americans, as I said a couple of weeks ago, is that you know, whilst we are enormously grateful for the continued support and investment they put into a European security, it's not right to rely on American taxpayers to do that if we're not prepared to make sacrifices for our own security. Now, I am. That's the decision I've made on defense spending. So when I'm in the US or when I talk to Americans, when David Cameron does, when Grant Shapps does, we're able to say we are leading. Right? We are investing more than anyone else in European security. That's the right thing to do. Others need to do the same and ensure that our alliance remains strong. Keir Starmer cannot say that. He cannot say to our American allies or to others that we are leading, that we are investing more in our own security. And that's of clear contrast. And look, on your last question, as I talked about it previously, I'll just end uh, on the same point. Right? I'm not for one second pretending everything about the last 14 years is perfect. Of course not. Right? It would be wrong to do that. I'm not doing that. But I am proud of the record. I was proud of the record when I made that speech too. Just take one thing, our education reforms, in large part pioneered by a lot of the work that happened here at Policy Exchange. Children from the most disadvantaged backgrounds now more likely to go to university than they were before. The attainment gap before COVID closed. Making sure that our kids are the best readers in the Western world. And again, that didn't happen by accident. It certainly is not happening in Wales, which Labour is in charge of, or in Scotland, where the SNP are in charge of. It happened here, in England, under a Conservative government. And I've always believed that the closest thing we have to a silver bullet is education. If you can create a world-class education system in the way that I described, that's how you transform people's lives for the better. That's how you give people the opportunity to flourish and build financial security in this new world. That's what this Conservative as government has done over the last 14 years, together with providing the financial security that we've needed so that we can respond to the shocks out there and continue to keep this country safe. So yes, I am proud of that, and I will always be proud of that, but the choice of the election is about the future in a more dangerous time, who can you trust to keep you safe? And it is only the Conservatives that have the bold actions required, the clear plan required, to keep this country safe and give our families a secure future. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak there outlining his vision. Uh, I'm going to go straight to our political correspondent, Hannah Miller, uh, to break down some of the key messages we heard there. Of course, we still don't have a date for the general election, uh, but the Conservatives have set out a vision there. Uh, Hannah, what stood out most to you? What was the central claim uh, that you picked up on? I think as a day, one of the most interesting things there was the response from the Prime Minister uh, to a question from Chris Mason, the BBC's political editor. Are you trying to claim that the country will be less safe under Keir Starmer? Quite clearly, he answered, yes, he does believe that. That is, of course, quite a claim, one that the Labour Party, I suspect, would strongly dispute. Rishi Sunak points to defence spending in his uh, when making that claim, he has committed to raising defence spending to 2.5% of national income by 2030. The Labour Party haven't put a time frame on it. They've said that they would aspire to do that when economic conditions allow. Of course, if you're going to spend 2.5% of national income on defence, what the Prime Minister isn't saying in his speech today is that means that you can't spend it on other areas of policy. Recent elections also suggest the results that we had in the local election suggest that people are now willing to vote for the Labour Party under Keir Starmer's leadership in a way that they weren't 
under Jeremy Corbyn. And I think that that is interesting because you see Rishi Sunak repeatedly trying to make a link, draw a line between Keir Starmer, the current Labour leader, who would say that he has significantly changed the Labour Party, and the fact that he stood in as part of Jeremy Corbyn's shadow cabinet, trying to kind of put him in a position and, and draw that line in people's minds between Keir Starmer and Jeremy Corbyn at a time when it suggests that that link has perhaps is, is less at the forefront of people's minds when they come to voting. The other thing that really stood out to me was this was of course a, a, a whole speech about security. There was no sort of new policy in there as such but Keir Starmer actually spoke a lot about security at the last Labour conference or, or not necessarily speaking about it as a kind of topic as such but as a kind of buzzword a kind of word that speaks to people in terms of their fears about international security and wars overseas but also in terms of their domestic security that sense of kind of personal financial stability and their prospects for their own individual lives it makes me think listening to all of that of this that that is very much a kind of a theme that is likely to come through in this year's general election whenever it comes because sort of by talking about security you give yourself if you're a politician a, a way of kind of encompassing absolutely everything in, in terms of how you speak to people and people's need to feel like there is a kind of leader there who has a plan and a vision for the country. All right, Hannah, thank you for that update. And of course, we do have a live page with more analysis from our correspondents.